The Lord be with you. We're going to be listening this morning to the 11th chapter of John's Gospel. John chapter 11, verses 1 through 45. And they read like this. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus. Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of Man may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after his, this, he, and he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble, because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble, because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he'll be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought that he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake I am glad I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. And while Mary stayed at home, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary get up and quickly go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. And Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd gathered standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he said this, he cried with a loud voice, 
Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. And Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Let us pray. And now, O oh God, give us ears to hear, eyes to see, hands and feet ready, hearts open to receive what you have for us. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. This story is the hinge upon which the entire narrative of the fourth gospel swings. It's a story that's rich with Easter allusions, not so subtle winks at Jesus' own death, burial, and resurrection. It's this very event which causes the high priest Caiaphas and the rest of the religious establishment to decide to put Jesus to death. It says as much just a few verses beyond our text this morning when it says, so from that day on, they plan to put Jesus to death. It's a story that shows the power of Christ. Man, do we need such a story now when we all feel perhaps so powerless. It's a story that shows the power of Jesus to resuscitate a man who had been dead for four days, sealed in a rock-caved tomb. And I suppose you could easily argue it's the most powerful of all of Jesus' signs. It tops healing the sick. It beats restoring sight to the blind, causing the lame to leap, and even feeding 5,000 people with a handful of fish and bread. It's a story that, at least for me, captures my imagination as I visualize Jesus standing before this cavernous tomb, the smell of death hissing from behind the stone as it's rolled away, breaking the seal between the dead and the living. You see Jesus standing there like those great concrete statues strewn about cemeteries, strong, determined, yet with this calmness that can seemingly hold back the cosmic power of the Creator. And He calls out Lazarus by name. And when He does, you can almost feel the, the pages of your Bible tremble at His voice. Then almost comically, as if the tension in the story was too great, wrapped in strips of cloth like a mummy from some mid-century matinee with a handkerchief over his face, out hops Lazarus, the one who had been dead but is now alive. Why, we may even pause for a moment to marvel at what happens at the end of this story, the evangelistic outcome in verse 45, when many of the Jews who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did believed in Him. We may pause there to ponder over the persuasive power of Jesus' reviving of Lazarus. This is no doubt one of the most memorable and captivating stories in all of Scripture. But I have to tell you, it captures my attention in a different way today. You see, while it's easy to get swept up in the resolution of the story, to focus one's attention on the powerful outcome of Christ's presence at the tomb of His beloved friend Lazarus, it's more than just a bit well, honestly, distracted by the beginning of the story. It's almost, it's almost like a, a discomfort you try to ignore, but it still comes around. You can't roll over on your side and it goes away. You can't scratch it and it goes away. It's just there. You see, I can't help but wonder why. Why did Jesus 
stay two days longer in the place where he was. After getting word from Mary and Martha that this one whom he loved was ill. Seriously, why? Now I know, I know, some folks will say, well, Jesus knew Lazarus would die, and he knew he was going to raise him from the dead, so Jesus just hung out a little while as a part of God's plan, and then went on his way to Bethany. And I suppose there's room for that sort of argument with with most people, with some people, but if I'm honest with you, it sounds too easy to me. It sounds a little too much like those one-liners some preachers give at funerals, you know, those sort of theologically veneered words that only attempt to speak to the spiritually complex, the difficult things surrounding death in the moment. God needed another angel in the heavenly choir, so God called your boy home. God's ways are higher than our ways. And I swear I even had a friend tell me that once he heard a preacher say at the funeral of a little child, well, you know, God just needed another flower in his garden, so he picked yours. Maybe. Maybe there's room in the text to say that Jesus tarried for two more days because it was a part of his plan. Perhaps verse 4 even suggests such a position, but if I'm honest with you, I don't buy it. It just doesn't sit well with me and what I believe about Jesus. It just doesn't seem right that Jesus would let his beloved friend die. That he would allow Mary and Martha to go through the pain of losing their brother, that he would stay in the place where he was long enough for the family to gather, for the mourners to come around, for the tomb to be opened, for the body to be prepared, for the funeral to be held, for the casseroles to be dropped off, the jugs of sweet tea and baskets of fried chicken left there on the counter at Martha and Mary's house, for the stone to be rolled back over the entrance of the tomb, And the body of Lazarus left to decay and rot. It just doesn't seem right. I don't buy it. Jesus lets these sorts of things happen because it's part of his plan. I'm not sure I buy that Jesus lets things like a coronavirus happen because it's part of his plan. I'd like to think that if it had been me instead of Jesus, it might have gone differently because, friends, I'm telling you right now, if Denise and Karis, my best friend's uh, sisters, sent word to me that my best friend was ill, lying in the ICU, perhaps with this virus, and he didn't have long to make it, it'd be hard not to want to leave my house to get in my car and start driving south to forget all this social distancing stuff and to be there, to be there with my beloved friend. And I bet most of you would do the same. You'd at least feel the same if you got such a call that you wouldn't want to be cramped up in the house. You'd want to be there. And I tell you, it just doesn't seem right to me especially given all the trouble that the fourth gospel goes through to tell us how much Jesus loves Lazarus. It's his nickname for crying out loud, the one whom you love, Jesus. It just seems to me like Jesus would have headed on down to Bethany as soon as he got word. Lord, the one whom you love is ill. To which Jesus I think should have rightly said. All right, boys, pack it up. We're heading down to Bethany. Lazarus isn't doing well, and y'all know I can heal him, so let's go. After all, wouldn't healing his sick friend have been just as powerful a sign? One he had done before, sure. One he, he knew he was capable of doing, but still powerful? Wouldn't healing Lazarus Avoided the broken hearts of two sisters, family, and friends? 
I'm telling you, it bothers me. It catches me every time I read this story. But I think another verse in this text may shed some light on this quandary. In many English translations, it's the shortest verse in the Bible. John 11.35. Most often rendered, Jesus wept. The NRSV uses the proper conjugation, I think, a bit better. Jesus began to weep. It's interesting to me what causes Jesus to begin weeping. In verse 32, it says, When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Did you notice that when we were reading? It's not the first time. It's important to notice they're the exact same words Martha uses in verse 21. After which, Jesus gives Martha this compact lesson on eternal life and resurrection, offering her one of those ego a me, those I am statements laced throughout this part of the fourth gospel. The story goes on to say in verses 33 and 34 that when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. And that's when he says, where have you laid him? And they said to him words that ring as a rhythm throughout John's gospel. Lord, come and see. It's that phrase uttered just before we're told that Jesus began to weep. Come and see that is filled with more meaning than we may realize. In three other places in this gospel, that exact phrase is used. Jesus speaks these words when he calls Andrew and Peter. At the very beginning, in the very first chapter, in the 39th verse, Philip speaks them when he calls Nathanael to join them in following Jesus just a few verses later. Who is this? Come and see. And then as we saw the last time we were together, the Samaritan woman at the well speaks these same words to Jesus in chapter 4, verse 29. When she speaks these words, rather, to the people about Jesus. In every case, including the one before us, when these weeping mourners respond to Jesus, these are words of invitation. Words that invite one to draw closer into the life of God's kingdom, to witness the inbreaking of the reality of God. It's at the speaking of these words, come and see, that Jesus begins to weep. And I think it may be because they are the words that have triggered something deep within Jesus. The emotional straw that breaks the camel's back. These were the words used to call people into the kingdom. Perhaps words Jesus had even used to call Lazarus to be his disciple. And now, these words are being spoken to Christ. And maybe, just maybe, those words, those three words, released in Jesus what he had been holding on to since he got word from Martha and Mary at least four days before. I don't really have to imagine what it's like. I don't have to imagine because I've been there. I remember when I got the message. It's been almost 11 years ago now. I was sitting in my office getting somewhat settled for the day when my phone rang and it was my dad. My dad doesn't call me. Dad never really calls. In fact, now that he knows how to text, he rarely calls. But when I answered the phone, I heard my dad say on the other end, Son, your grandma ain't doing too good, and it won't be long now. Just want to let you know and ask if you would do the funeral. I had never really done a funeral up to that point, and I had been to a few, but actually hadn't put one together, and 
So I thought about it, and then, of course, I told my dad I would because I couldn't imagine anyone else who would, and I didn't want some preacher who didn't know my grandma trying to preach her into hell or everybody else into heaven. So dad told me they weren't sure how long she'd hold out, but it could be a week or two, and it wasn't. It was a day or two. The next phone call came. I packed a suit, a white shirt, black shoes, a tie along with my Bible, and Sally and I drove down to Enterprise. Looking back, I, I really wasn't all that upset. It was just sort of, well, i got to go do this thing. And I mean, I went to my home church there. I sat in worship that Sunday morning. Nothing really bothered me. I sat there, talked to people like nothing bad in the world had happened. I showed up that afternoon at the visitation. There was my dad, my aunts, my uncles, my cousins, standing beside what I thought was a rather showy casket, one that I was sure one of my aunts or uncles had picked out. But I was fine. I shook hands with people who knew me, even though I didn't know them, saw people I hadn't seen in years, maybe decades. I, I was hugged by total strangers, people I had known my whole life. And still, I was fine. Grandma was in that box wearing a dress. I, I didn't know she even owned one. I'd always seen her in elastic waisted jeans and t-shirts and black rubber boots and dirty white tennis shoes. Her hair was fixed, which was a bit odd. She was wearing makeup, which I swear I'd never seen her wear in my life. And I distinctly remember that her glasses were clean. They were never clean. But there she was in that box. But still, I, I was fine. But the next day came, I put on my suit, my white shirt, my tie, my black shoes. I carried my Bible and the five by seven note cards I had scratched down a service on. And I was fine. I arrived at the funeral home the hour before with the rest of my family. And there was this time of awkward handshakes and hugs. More introductions of people who knew me without me knowing them. More time to look at Grandma in that box, but still, I was fine. And eventually the funeral director asked all the friends to have a seat in the chapel. He pulled the stiff accordion divider closed and shut the doors leading into the parlor. He told us we'd have a few more minutes with Grandma before the service. And a few of my folks stepped out the side door to burn one more cigarette before the, the service. I suppose they thought I might have gone on a little too long. And while the rest just sort of mumbled to each other and counted the threads in the carpet. But I was fine. After a few minutes passed, the funeral director walked back in, gave a few instructions about the service, and then said, before we go out, I'm going to ask the minister to offer a word of prayer. And apparently, I was the only one looking around because I forgot I, in this case, was the minister. But I was fine. Prayer is easy. I do it all the time. I do it pro bono most of the time. I've done the same things countless times for families in living rooms, and have done it more times than I care to remember now in funeral home parlors and, well, in that back Sunday school room before services. I looked around at the people in the room and I said, let us pray. And in that moment, I saw people that I know hadn't darkened the door of a church in decades, folks who drank, folks who cuss, folks who smoke, ran around, lied, cheat, and steal, folks who were decent enough, but likely wouldn't make anyone's list of outstanding citizens. I saw them all bow their heads and close their eyes like it was something they did every day after lunch. And I said, let us pray. And the next word out of my mouth was God. And that was it. Turns out I wasn't fine after all. My throat had closed up. My jaw felt like it was going to shake loose from my head. My eyes were burning and heavy. I tried to say more, but I couldn't. All I could say was a choked, God. I had put off the inevitable for as long as I could. I had resisted the urge to mourn, believing there was something more important, some task that needed tending to first, pushing off the emotion, pushing off the weight, pushing it all back. But I couldn't hold it back any longer. 
That word broke the emotional levy. And in that room, in that moment, there were no one-liners that could be said to me. No bumper sticker religion that could console me. Nothing that was going to make me feel better. No, in that moment, I needed the kind of faith that said it was okay to weep, to sob. The kind of faith that made it all right to mourn. The kind of faith that recognizes the reality of pain and grief that comes with life and death. I needed that kind of faith. The kind that says in strange and unusual times, it's okay to be a little scared. It's okay to be anxious. It's okay if you put it off for as long as you can and you can't take it anymore. I believe we all need that kind of faith. Because when the time comes, the quaint sayings we offer to others won't be enough to sustain us. Maybe that time is now. Maybe it's still ahead of us. We need a faith that tells us it's okay to be overwhelmed. And for some of us, we might be overwhelmed these days. We need the kind of faith that tells us that the weight of the world is impossible to carry alone. And even when we're far away from one another, that we still bear it together. That when our hearts break and our minds are troubled, we have a God in Christ who has been there too. And we will go, and will go there with us time and time again. Because He's never going to leave. Never going to give up on us. And never, never means even beyond death itself. That's the kind of faith we need. And thanks be to God, it's the kind of faith we have. That's the kind of Savior we have in Christ Jesus. Whose heart breaks when our hearts are broken. Whose mind is troubled when our minds cannot be still. Who, who puts off the emotional weight when we put it off too. Whose eyes weep when we can't hold back the tears anymore. Who stares blankly at the wall. And we just don't know what to make of the time that we're in. That's the kind of Savior we have. The kind of God we have in Jesus. One who doesn't dismiss our distress as a lack of faith. One who doesn't say, well, y'all aren't meeting for church, so you must not have faith. It's the kind of God who is always there. Whether we're in this room together or in our living rooms apart. That's the kind of God we have. The kind of God who will always call us back, reminding us in winks and whispers that death does not have the last word, that fear does not have the last word, that the grave is but a temporary plot, and that there will always, always be life after death. And there will always be light after the darkness. Would you pray with me? And now, O oh Christ, be with us in our anxiety. Be with us in our fear. Remind us, Lord, not only that you are here with us, but you have been there yourself before us. That no matter... No matter where we may go, no matter where our spirit and our minds may lead, that you are there with us. And that we do not go alone, but with you and with one another. Be with us this week, Holy Spirit, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.